How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the New Testament Theologist YouTube channel. I'm Nick, and previously I had done a video on Romans 9-5, specifically within the broader context of my series on Romans chapters 8 through 11, and so uh, I wanted to dive in a little deeper on something that I wish I had done more of. So I'm not getting rid of what I argued about, say, Jesus in Romans 9-5, as the point of this video make clear, but perhaps to give a little more meat to the bones of what I argued. And it's just one of those things where you discover something and you think it's interesting and you want to share it with the world. Uh, the video has been cited uh, numerous times, you know, the, the church split, Will Hess, I know uh, Braxton Hunter, I believe made mention of it. I could be wrong. I, I think it was them. Um, but you also have all these other things going on. I mean, I, I noticed the channel was, uh, the comment section was blowing up with all sorts of Unitarians and all this sort of goofy stuff. I'm like, well, all right, that's cool. I guess people... People need to talk about stuff, apparently. So it's one of those where I was like, well, I think this would be interesting to kind of just take a moment to offer what an early church father had to say directly on this subject. And it doesn't mean it's decisive. You know, we have to weigh all of the evidence. But I was doing a little bit of research and this came up and I thought it was interesting. And I figured just a quick short video on what this one early church father had to say about Romans 9, 5 and Jesus as God. Uh, and I figured this would be really interesting to share. So let me show you what I'm actually talking about. All right, and so I'll be reading from Origins uh, Commentary on the Epistles of the Romans, books 6 through 10. It's, this is, of course, translated by Thomas P. Sheck, and this is in the Fathers of the Church uh, series. And this is on, specifically, uh, book 7, chapter 13, and what we might call uh, section 8. And I'll read the whole thing, so I'm going to read the whole thing, and we're going to go through it together and all that. I'm not going to offer a lot of commentary, but I figured this would be really interesting. And so this is... Uh, th this is Origen talking about Romans 9, 5 specifically. And so he says, the worship and the promises. He calls the priestly duties worship, promises, refers to those who made, those that were made to the fathers and that are hoped to be given to those who, through faith, are called Abraham's sons. But it is certain that not only the fathers, but also the Christ came from that race, i.e. from the Israelite race, according to the flesh. As he also says through the prophet, woe to them because my flesh is from them. And he's citing, of course, uh, Hosea 9.12 from the Septuagint. Uh, but, but why woe to them? Because Jesus was born, quote, for the fail or the falling and the resurrection of many. And that's, of course, Luke 2.34. And because he was rejected by those from whom his flesh was descended. And that's Matthew 13.57. Um, and he was received by the Gentiles by whom he was not known, as he also says through David, quote, a people whom I have not known have served me, and that's Psalm 18, 43. And from them, therefore, is also the Christ according to the, 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 according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. He has already described Christ according to the flesh and according to the spirit earlier in the earlier part of this letter where he says, who was born from the seed of David according to the flesh and was destined to be son of God with power according to the spirit of sanctification or spirit of holiness, depending on how you render it. That's from Matthew 1, chapter 1, or I'm sorry, not Matthew, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And he says, continues on, we have to the best of our ability... Uh, given a more complete explanation of how he is the son of God according to the spirit and the son of David according to the flesh. And that's earlier on, he, he references. The one then whom he there calls the son of God according to the spirit, here he declares to be the very, quote, God who is over all. Uh, because the level of doctrine is advancing for those who are making progress, as one might expect for hearers. And he has a footnote here where he says, as early as Aaron is, and this is, uh, I believe this is Sheck's footnote, as early as Arianus against Heresies 3.16.2, Romans 1.4 and Romans 9.5 were linked together in the churches developing Christology. So that's interesting. I think they're certainly relevant there. Then Origen says, what amazes me is how certain persons who read that the same apostle elsewhere says elsewhere, quote, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, end quote, should deny that the Son of God ought to be confessed to be God, lest they should appear to speak of two gods. And he uh, then there's a footnote, Erasmus, CWE 56, uh, 250, thought this passage was directed against Arius and therefore attributed it to Origen's translator, Rufinus. Uh, but as R. Sider, however, indicates, the words may, uh, the words may refer to the monarchians, uh, quote, who also saw in, in incipient orthodoxy the implication of two gods. The monarchians were well established before Origen wrote. And then Kelly Doctrine, page 117 and others. So there's that material as well. What will they, and going back to the text, what will they do about this passage of the apostle in which Christ is explicitly recorded to be, quote, God over all? 
But those who interpret these things this way fail to observe that he has not called the Lord Jesus Christ one Lord in such a way that therefore God the Father may not be called Lord. Likewise, he has not called God the Father one God in a sense in which the Son would not be believed to be God. For that scripture is true that says, quote, know that the Lord himself is God, and that is from Psalm 100 verse 3. But both are one God, since there is no other source of deity for the Son than the Father. But of that one paternal founda- or fountain, as wind- wisdom says, the Son is, quote, uh, is, quote, the purest emanation. That's from Wisdom of Solomon 725. And uh, origin is also probably implying eternal generation here, um, which tells us that this sort of language does not imply subordinationism, although origin had issues with subordinationism as in terms of how he read uh, certain texts in Cor- uh, 1 Corinthians. But that's beyond the scope of this very short video, uh, short video by my standards, at least. Uh, Christ, therefore, is God over all, but over all of what? Doubtless over those things we spoke about a short time, a short while ago, quote, over principalities and authorities and powers and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the future. And of course, he's referencing Ephesians 1.21. He, flipping the page, who is over all has no one over himself, but he himself is not later than the father, but from the father. Again, eternal generation. But the wisdom of God has granted that this same thing be understood of the Holy Spirit as well, where it says, quote, the spirit of the Lord filled the earth and he who contains all things has knowledge of his voice. And that is wisdom, uh, chapter one, verse seven, wisdom of Solomon. If therefore the son is called, quote, God over all and the Holy Spirit is recorded to contain all things, but God is the father from whom are all things. And that, of course, is uh, one Corinthians eight, six, as he referenced earlier. Then clearly the nature and essence of the Trinity, which is over all things, are shown to be one. And then, uh, yeah. And so that is Origen's very brief and terse take on Romans 9.5 as it relates to Christ being referred to as God. And why this is important. At the end of the day, why is this important? The early church were native speakers of the Greek language. They knew the Greek language much better than I or Daniel Wallace or Stanley Porter or Bill Mounts or pick, pick whoever you want, right? Uh, they, 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 this was the language they actively spoke and knew and, and delighted in. This was the way they talked. And so um, this doesn't mean that they are perfect in their understanding of it because there's other issues to at play, you know, theological, sociocultural stuff. There's all that sort of stuff. But what it does tell us is that native speakers understood Romans 9, 5, not to refer to two separate doxologies or to two separate persons, but to the Messiah being called God over all. And that is a very helpful early witness, or at least, you know, origins writing a few hundred years later, but that is a very helpful early native speaker uh, of Greek, who explicitly attributes this in rejection of Arianism and subordinationism and all that sort of stuff, attributes uh, what we might call the Jesus is God reading of Romans 9.5. And that's important for our his- for uh, reception history. It's important for us how we understand the text of scripture and how um, we are debtors to tradition and history. Um, and I say this as a ordained Baptist pastor, right? We are debtors to our tradition uh, for better or for ill. In this case, I think it's for better. But all this to say, at the end of the day, the importance of Origen's literature here is that it testifies to the early belief that Jesus was not only called God, but that certain texts that are, quote, disputed nowadays by us martyred interpreters, they were not so disputed in the sense of what the early church thought. Uh, they attributed those readings to heretics, say the Arians or the Monarchians, and they were less uh, interested in kind of placating that sort of reading. So all this to say, all this to say, um, Romans 9, 5 is explicitly tied to Jesus's deity and Origen as an early interpreter of Paul took it that way as well. And so not only do I think this bolsters my own reading of Romans 9, 5, which seems to be probably the slim majority reading nowadays, you know, Robert Jewett um, against folks like, say, the late and great Jimmy Dunn and others. And so what this kind of tells us is uh, that early speakers of the Greek language and the patristic witness, not exclu- exclusively or exhaustively, but or- in Origen's case, when directly commentary- commentating on the passage, explicitly attributed uh, godness to Jesus Christ and didn't see it as a problem and didn't see it as involving tritheism or subordinationism. And it seems that the eternal generation controversy that kind of arose from evangelicalism over the past few years over debates on the subordination of the Trinity and tying it in with women in ministry and all that sort of nonsense, are without a leg to stand on. Eternal generation seems to be how origin differentiated persons within the Trinity. And that 
is seen in Romans 9.5 and why Romans 9.5 is such an important witness and why the patristic witness to this text is so vital to our understanding it in our modern time.